and welcome to Round Robin. I'm your host, Robin McCormick with the City of Hampton. And today we have a health topic and some surprising new ways that you may not know about to treat vascular issues. My guest is Dr. Todd Gensler from Centero. Welcome. Thank you, Robin. Thank you very much. So this is something I don't know a lot about, and I'm going to make you <laughs> talk down to me because it is very obviously very complicated. But as a vascular surgeon, what is, um, what is the main thing that you do most commonly? Most commonly, we treat blockage in blood vessels. Okay. Many, many blood vessels in the body get full of plaque. Atherosis. Because that's because we um, don't eat right. Well, there are, there <laughs> and are other reasons. There are five main <laughs> risk factors for atherosclerosis. Okay. And that's high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, smoking, and then having a family history of premature atherosclerosis so, of heart So the family adult. history I can't do anything about. That's correct. But the other things I have some control over. Funny thing you say that. That's exactly <laughs> what we tell our patients. You can control four of the five, but certainly you cannot control the fifth one. Right. So all of those risk factors lead to depositing plaque and calcium in the blood vessel. That's why it's called athero. That's the plaque. Sclerosis is hardening. Atherosclerosis of the blood vessels. And so the blood vessels that most commonly get affected are those in the neck, the carotid arteries that carry blood flow to the brain, um, those in the abdomen that carry blood flow to the kidneys or carry blood flow to the intestines, uh, those blood vessels that carry blood flow to the legs, um, and there that's sort of the, the gamut of the hardening of the arteries that we, we, uh, we treat. I tell my patients I treat all the blood vessels in the body with the exception of the ones that go to the heart and the ones that are in the brain. Right, there are special, other specialists That's for that. That's correct, yes ma'am. So the carotid is a pretty common one. It is. Why? <laughs> Why is it common? I, my father-in-law had that surgery as well and I, yeah. So that's a wonderful question. You know, the, um, the carotid artery starts as the common carotid artery and then it divides. There is a Y in the common carotid artery. And there's an internal carotid artery, that's the one that continues to the brain, and there's an external carotid artery. That's the one that has branches that bring blood flow to your ear or to your mouth or to your nose, to your face, all different parts of the, the scalp and the skull other than the brain. And at that division, at that, we call it a bifurcation, at that crossroads, plaque tends to deposit there. Uh -huh. and, um, you know, there's a scientific explanation with wall stress and shear stress and low shear stress and high shear stress, but for some reason it tends to, we think... Hit that Y and just right, sort of... That's right, hit that Y and it eddies and, and then the plaque tends to deposit there. Now, how does someone know that they have um, plaque in their, in their vessels? So most of the time... You don't. Um, <laughs> you don't, you know. Um, so we'll start with the carotid, for instance. You know, the predominance amount of patients are asymptomatic. And so if they have risk factors, if they're smokers or if cholesterol high, or if they have blockage in other blood vessels in their body, then we, we have a reason to screen them for carotid disease. Um, that's the asymptomatic category. And then those patients who have strokes, who get weak on one side of their body or one side of their face or can't talk or uh, for instance, a curtain or a shade is brought down over their, their eyes uh, or one eye, then they are symptoms that lead us to wanting to check for blockage in the carotid artery. And then that's another reason to look with an ultrasound, um, a non-invasive way to find out if there's blockage there or if there isn't. So I'm like slow, and I would have thought that, you know, you, you hear blockage and you think, heart attack risk, mm -hmm. but blockage could be, it, 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 here it's a stroke risk. That's correct. And other places the risk is? So for instance, um, if the blockage is in the pelvic area, in the iliac arteries or in the legs, then when patients walk, the large muscle groups, either the calf or the thigh or the buttock, they need more blood flow whenever we walk. And so if there is a blockage, then the blood vessel can't accommodate the increased need for blood flow, and then that muscle group hurts, cramps, and makes the patient stop walking, makes them rest for two, three, maybe five minutes. Then that muscle group can recover, the lactic acid goes away, and then they can walk again. 
This is fascinating, and you're actually making it so that I can understand. I really appreciate that. I'm happy to do that. Wow. So how do people get referred to you? So that's a, you know, we get referrals from the primary care physicians. Um, we get referrals from the cardiologists. Most of the cardiologists take care of the heart and don't take care of the, mm -hmm. we call it the periphery, the per <laughs> peripheral <laughs> arterial disease. And so All we get, the things around That's the exactly heart. right. That's exactly right. And so we get referrals from those people. Um, to tell you the truth, the longer you're here, the more word of mouth goes from place to place. And then one patient says, hey, who, so, whoever, obviously, Dr. Gensler will take good care of you, and so we get referrals that way. Um, and then, you know, uh, we tried to do some marketing and, and bring patients in that way, but for the most part, it's but, I mean, from the primary care. But I mean, people have to be sent, uh, have to have it diagnosed generally somewhere else, so and then they... Generally, they come with a diagnosis, or they come with an ultrasound that shows that they've had disease. But we say our doors are always open. Okay. You know, if you have a, a problem with walking and your legs hurt when you walk, then call the office. You know, the only thing that gets in the way there is your insurance company. Every once in a while, the insurance oh, yeah. companies require They want you to be referred require, sometimes. Right, yeah. Require a referral. So what kinds of surgery do you do? What kind of advances um, have been made? So back in when I trained, uh, which was, wow, 20, 22, 23 years ago when we got out of that, um, if we were going to fix something, just about all the time, it took a scalpel. Mm -hmm. It took an incision to fix. And as time has gone on, we become less and less invasive. You know, the, the biggest, I would say, advancement in our field is in the area of aneurysm repair. You know, we've talked about the general group of blockage in blood vessels. We also fix aneurysms. Whenever the blood vessel wall weakens, then the blood vessel expands. And, enlarges and the bigger the blood vessel is the more prone it is to rupture or the more prone it is to clot and so it used to be especially in the abdomen if you had an abdominal aortic aneurysm also known as a triple a which if ruptures is a killer mm. um, we would have to make a big incision either up and down or crossways uh, or and Across the, all that muscle, long recovery time. That's correct. And they would have to be in the hospital for, you know, at, in the best of all worlds, four days, and then most of the time, seven to ten days. And it took the wind out of their sails. Mm -hmm. um, now, today, so that's the next step. We would make incisions in both groins and then put a little graft through the artery, release this graft inside the blood vessel, inside the aorta, the main blood vessel, so that the blood then went through this tube mm -hmm. that had a cut, that had a sort of a scaffolding, a stent on it, and then a covering over it. A, so it's a stent graft we would put inside the aneurysm so that the blood, fl bl blood flow would then go through the graft and not get into the aneurysm sac so that the aneurysm sac no longer would be pressurized. Right, And then right. that markedly reduces the risk of the aneurysm rupturing. So we went from a big incision to two incisions, and now we can do aneurysm repair percutaneously. Per meaning through, cutaneous, the skin. Mm -hmm. So we just put, again, a needle in the artery in each groin, a wire through that needle, and then we, we use the word upsize. You know, it's not the size of the wire the hole in the artery. The mm -hmm. size of the hole in the artery is, uh, is you know, is about, I'm going to use millimeters, you know, is about four millimeters or five millimeters, um, a quarter of an inch to three-eighths of an inch. And then our tubes go through the groin arteries and it, uh, sort of all roads lead to Rome. You can start in just about any artery in the body and get to where you need to go. Um, and then we release this endograft into the aorta so that the blood flow then goes through this endograft and doesn't, again, same thing, doesn't get into the aneurysm. That's so cool. And in that case, how long is the recovery time? So those patients go home the next day. Wow. Yeah, they go home the next day. We, um, we ask that they don't drive for a few days. Um, normally it's a week. Um, and then they're basically back to doing whatever they pretty much whatever they want to do at that point. That's amazing. Now, what about the carotid? So those patients stay overnight in the hospital normally, and then they go home the next day. 
And I tell them, as soon as you don't have pain in your neck, then you can get behind the wheel of a car and you can drive around. Um, we don't enter a body cavity whenever we do the carotid endarterectomy. Of course, if we do an open aneurysm repair, we enter a body cavity that prolongs the recovery. But when we just cut the skin and retract the muscle, the recovery is much you know, faster. It's very much faster. And so you're correct. doing this with a scope, right? You're, you're seeing what is inside. Yeah, so we do it with, Super cool. with an x-ray machine. Okay, so we, we fill the blood vessels with dye and that gives us a road map and shows us where the aneurysm is or where the blood vessel is blocked. And then with an x-ray machine on a screen, we see exactly you know, what the lay of the land is and then direct our therapy wherever the problem is, whether it's putting the graft in or whether it's opening the blood vessel up. Wow. Wow, that's really, I bet, and to see all these changes during your career is pretty cool too, so right? I, I, you're very intuitive, <laughs> Robin. Um, so yeah, it's been, a one, it's been an awesome time to be a vascular surgeon. You know, when, we, when I first started again, it took um, a scalpel to fix everything, and now we can fix, I don't want to be over, I don't want to overstate, but we can fix just about everything, you know, through a little needle in the skin into the artery and then repairing it that way. That's so amazing. And then the facilities at the Careplex Hospital are obviously then pretty state of the art. They are state of the art. Um, they, we have, you know, an angio, we have actually two angio suites where we can do whatever we need to do to the blood vessels. We tend to still reserve the aneurysm work <clears throat> or sometimes we do hybrid procedures. So a hybrid procedure combines an incision with an endo within the blood endovascular procedure. And we, nor, we don't, we have not come to the point that we're making incisions in the angio suite, we'll go to the operating room for those. But whereas it used to be, if you made, if you, you had to do a bypass in the leg to get around that, the blockage right. that, you know, there's patients who, who either had pain in their legs when they walked or began to develop gangrene in their feet and were losing their legs, mm -hmm. you know, that's sort of the continuum of problems after the blood vessels begin to get blocked in the legs. Then we would have to get a vein out of the leg, a vein in the arm, or another, you use the word conduit, another tube mm -hmm. that we would connect to the artery in the groin. We would bypass around wherever the blockage wherever the was block. and then reconnect that tube, that vein or that graft to another artery lower. Well, now you can just make an incision in the groin and then through the groin you can try to get your wire through the blockage either in this, either from above down or from below up. Um, or you can sometimes even core the plaque out of the blood vessel as it runs through the thigh. That it's, is great. So that is a huge thing for people uh, with plaque anywhere. I mean, that's just an amazing treatment. Yeah. And so, yeah, so we do all of that at, at CarePlex. All right. Well, is there anything um, about your job uh, and people and their care of vascular issues is, that I haven't asked you about that you want to talk about? Um, sure. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, when you, when you look at the, the lower extremities, um, again, there is a continuum. The, the first symptom that patient, many patients will get is this pain in the calves or pain in the thighs when they walk claudication, and then they'll develop pain in their feet at night. Gravity is a force that actually draws blood flow down to the foot, and so when patients go to bed at night and put their feet up, then gravity can't work to help blood flow get down to the foot anymore. So those patients may complain of numbness, coldness, pain that will wake them up from their sleep, make them hang their foot over the side of the bed, or get up and walk around. And so that that's way, a big sign, big red flashing sign that's a that big you need, red flashing sign. <laughs> need and to that's, call. And we call that rest pain, pain at rest, rest pain. And then of course if they start to get a sore on one of their toes or their heel and that's not going away like it always used to go away, then we call that tissue loss and that's another reason. And then of course, if the foot starts to turn black, then, that's, that's, that. <laughs> then they really need to see Hopefully it. they've caught, caught it before yes, then, but. Hopefully, but you're right, that doesn't, that doesn't always happen. Uh, another huge cadre of patients that we take care of are the dialysis patients, are the patients whose kidneys have failed. And that is a huge part of our practice here in Hampton Roads. And <clears throat> we, when patients need dialysis, there are basically two ways to be dialyzed, mm -hmm. through the blood or through the the fluid that's in the abdomen. And through the blood we call hemodialysis, through the fluid in the abdomen we call that peritoneal dialysis. 
And when somebody needs hemodialysis, normally we have to connect an artery and a vein together and make a fistula. Mm -hmm. okay? Normally the blood flows, th flows through the artery into the smaller and smaller blood vessels called the capillaries and then returns through the small veins and then to the larger veins until it gets, like we've said, until it gets back to the heart. So if you bypass the capillary bed, connect the artery and the vein directly, then you get a high pressure in a vein. A vein is used to low pressure and then that vein over time will increase in its size. It will dilate. And then that's how they, you, they connect these patients to the dialysis machine, put needles into these, to the vein, which is in a superficial position in the arm, um, and is not risk to bleed so much compared to if you had to put needles in the artery every time patients mm -hmm. had to dialyze. So we do that. And there is a new procedure um, called Wavelink. <clears throat> Again, we're getting less and less invasive. Normally when we make a fistula, we make an incision. We make an incision at the wrist, or we make an incision at the elbow, or inside the upper arm. Uh, and this Wavelink procedure, we either go through the wrist with a needle in the artery, a needle in the vein, or we go through the artery in the vein, up in the upper arm, to either the radial artery in the radial vein, or the ulnar artery in the ulnar vein, we have a, a tube that has magnets on. Each tube has magnets. These magnets will align themselves. And then there's a little electrode that will burn a hole through the vein into the artery and then connect the artery and the vein together. And uh, as one of my fellows would always say, who's from Canada, voila, then you have, a, you have a fistula between the artery and the vein without an incision. Oh my gosh. So we call that an endovascular arteriovenous fistula. And so, yeah, and so Careplex is the only place on the peninsula that offers, you know, that procedure. That is fascinating. It is. Yeah, we're very excited about that too. Wow. So that's the dialysis patients. And of course, if patients have blood vessel blockage in, their, in the blood vessels that carry blood flow to the intestines, then we can put stents in those blood vessels, um, you know, and Patients get aneurysms in the arteries behind the knee, their palpatio arteries, um, we fix those. And, you know, I could go on. And on. <laughs> we'll give people a break, though. Yes. And we, but we will remind them to call your office if they have questions or issues. You know, maybe people are watching this and don't realize what that resting pain in their foot mm -hmm. is. And, and this will help them seek treatment before it's a, a more critical situation. Yeah. Exactly. Well, thank you so much. It's I have learned pleasure. a lot. I'm <laughs> glad to hear that. Thank you. It's a wonderful opportunity. And thank you for watching because I hope you've learned as much as I have. This has been explained so much more clearly and you can understand some of these vascular issues and the symptoms so that you do seek treatment before it's too late. Thanks for watching.